Welcome to Red Beard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and my grandfather worked at Boeing for 30 years as a tool and die guy. In those 30 years, he missed zero days of work. Zero. No sick days. Not a single sick day in 30 years. My grandfather belongs to an era that looks completely different than our era. There's still the same things like, yes, he worked at Boeing and Boeing still exists. But the world he lived in, his reality of you go to work for one company, you show up there, you work your nine to five or your eight to five, and you just keep on showing up, you keep on doing the same thing, and you keep on doing it well. That's what good looks like. That world is in the past. We live in a world now where we do not know what good looks like. We know some of it, but we also know that we don't know all of it. And we're continually asking, what else do I not know? Because I know that I'm profoundly ignorant of something. And some of those things I'm aware of where I know, oh, this is a blind spot. That's a blind spot. I should deal with that. But there's some parts where we're not sure. We don't even know what we don't know. And we have our guest today, Corey Snyder, an expert on partnerships. We had him back here in episode 14. He's done partnership work for Infusionsoft, ZenReach, ActiveCampaign, MaraPost. And he's going to share with us what the reality and the future looks like for partnerships and how to use partnerships to grow your business with a special focus on those firms with 10 or less people to help us understand what questions are we not asking that we should be asking to understand how to use partnerships to grow our business. Welcome back to the show, Corey. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back. I'm so excited because back when you worked at Infusionsoft, now called Keep, you were one of my favorite people there. And when you left, I was sad. I thought, oh man, he's leaving. That sucks. <laughs> and then we got to stay connected over time as you went from ZenReach, Active Campaign, now you Mara Post. And it's fun because while these are all companies involved in marketing and automation and whatever, you've stayed within this channel of partnerships and helping companies develop through partnerships. And so the, even though the job titles have changed, your focus has not, which is sort of funny because in my grandfather's case, like he was a Boeing for 30 years. He was a tool <laughs> and die guy. And maybe that title changed a little bit, but I bet it didn't much. Like that's what he did. He did one thing for one company. Now you're doing one thing, but across a variety of companies and you're serving I don't know, thousands of other companies in the 10 people and under market, helping them understand what do partnerships look like for companies in that size and what do they need to know? So Give us the future. We're recording this in December of 2020. I want to hear, Corey, in 2021, what is it the smaller firms should be doing to go and think about how they can use partnerships to grow their business? Well, it's kind of an interesting topic because when you look at 10, 15 years ago, marketing automation as a whole, in the sense of an all-in-one sales and marketing software, was groundbreaking, right? We went from like an act and sage solution, which was, hey, you buy it, you throw it in your computer as a CD and it works. And then you have to wait till an update is done. And it wasn't very quick. Then you go to marketing automation, you have now in the cloud, so on and so forth. And how fast have we moved since then? Now we're talking AI and machine learning and all these other things. Yeah. As far as partnerships is concerned, the great part about it is it also has evolved. It also has transcended other and leaped other chasms, if you will. And what I mean by that is basically when you look at partnerships in the past, it was heavy, heavy ISPs and MSPs and so on and so forth. It was also distributors and things like that. And those still exist. But the world, as far as marketing automation is concerned, has created a whole nother area, a whole nother element of partnerships. And those are from marketing agencies and marketing consultants. And given the current pandemic that we're in with COVID, it has really expedited e-commerce launch and specifically the e-commerce partnerships and the e-commerce platforms. If I was to look into my crystal ball looking into next year, I think you're going to see a lot more softwares and a lot more platforms coming out that are going to be focused on the remote work. A lot more partnerships and platforms coming out on the e-commerce space and how do they evolve? And that's who's going to be left behind are the ones that can't move fast because it is going to move extremely fast. It already has moved fast. You've seen what happened with Zoom and other solutions as soon as remote went active. How many struggles that Zoom had as far as their bandwidth was concerned immediately. So again, if I was looking at my crystal ball, partnerships are going to be a massive win going into 2021. 
in my opinion, they already have, but they're going to become even more prevalent going into 2021 because companies are going to look to scale their organizations in a different way. Instead of adding headcount, they're going to look at outsourcing work instead of those sort of methodologies and practices, if you will. Give me a concrete example. And let's say one that a, that a company would care about, let's say that's under a quarter million in revenue. What kind of partnership opportunities might exist in 2021 for that kind of company that maybe they're not aware of yet? Yeah, good question. I think first and foremost, I would say the one of the biggest struggles is that 90% of the partnerships I've worked with have been probably less than 10 employees. And those are all agencies or a resellers, that type of profile. One of the biggest mistakes they've made is they have gone to an extent exclusive, not intentional, but they've been exclusive, meaning they have put so much time and energy and employment into one platform. Instead of diversifying, instead of creating their stack approach, that is going to be a massive miss going into 2021 because there's going to be so much revenue opportunity with other platforms as they expand and potentially surpass other brands that you holding down to one or you not opening up other opportunities and services would be detrimental to your growth. So to give you that one example, though, that one example, quickly thinking about it would be on the e-commerce side of the house, but you want to look at the services. So anytime you build out a partner program, anytime you look at partnering with other partners, I always look at what services are they offering and what services do I need, right? So from an agency standpoint, one to 10 employees, you want to be looking at First and foremost, you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you like to do, you're good at doing, and you want to do it for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't look into 2021 and be like, they're going to e-commerce. I'm going to e-commerce because that's where all the money is. Uh huh. You could do that and then end up hating life because you hate e-commerce. I would say the biggest point here is that find your next service offering, whatever that service offering is, and don't be shy about reaching out to the companies to partner with them. Give me some specific examples here. Let's make this 20% more concrete to help my brain wrap around. Your wisdom is so high level that I'm having trouble mapping my specific experiences onto it. So what's a specific example of what you're talking about? Great. Yeah. So when you look at email marketing, that is a massive umbrella. Yeah. Same with partnerships. Same with e-commerce is a great example of very much an umbrella. Whereas you have individuals that have offered services so down the line as far as all I do is monitor your emails. All I do is create email content. All I do is create your storefronts. All I do is help you create your products. Mm -hmm. All the way down to that. Look at services that people aren't necessarily offering or that there's an opportunity to offer. And that's where you go to market. Same thing with a vertical. This actually applies directly to the same as a vertical, services in a vertical. If you see a vertical as an opportunity from a, let's say, a dentist, you're going to go heavy into dentistry. But keep in mind, you don't want to be the end all be all for the niche. You want to be marketing automation. You want to be content. You want to be this. Same things apply to services. Whatever services you offer, it doesn't have to be this massive end all be all service offering. You don't have to be a full service, full suite agency. I've seen tons of agencies doing extremely well and they literally offer just content creation. And so everything else they're farming out. So let's say I'm all about the chat bots and I've taken Mackenzie Lieberman's course on many chat, I might be a many chat agency, you're saying that it would be then wise to go and develop a relationship, say with Clavio or Keep or Maripost or whoever, to go have a way to go say, well, I'm doing your chatbot stuff. But this company over here, I have a relationship with the partners of this other app. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a great example. I mean, give an example with partnerships we have at Maripost, right? We launched our partner program, uh, about five weeks ago, we have a little over 70 partners. And what we're realizing within that partner group is we have those that are evangelists, that are trusted advisors, that are experts in their industry as far as they can give you tips and advice and things like that. Then we have our agencies and then we have our app partners. The app partners is where it gets super, super interesting because it's a very specific integration. It does this. And that's where we're seeing the most success from our customers is the customers come to us and they need to solve one need. And we can turn around now and say, oh, we have a partner that solves that. Mm -hmm. So now when the customers come to us and say, we need to cancel because we don't have this, or here's the issue we're running into, I can turn around and go specifically hunt for that partnership and say, we need you because our customers are asking for it. But they're not coming to us and saying, we need somebody to manage everything. They're coming to us saying, we have an issue with deliverability, not necessarily saying that's the case as an example. <laughs> yeah. 
everyone complains about deliverability and they're all right and they're also all wrong. That's my understanding from being in the industry for almost a decade now is, <laughs> I think Adrian Savage said it that, I'm going to misquote him now, of course, but essentially most of your deliverability problems are your fault, not your email service provider or not your CRM. <laughs> they're mostly your fault. <laughs> and if you fix all those, then maybe it's your CRM. But even then, talk to an expert like Adrian Savage at wedeliver.email and he does a deliverability dashboard. And that guy knows about email deliverability. And if you go to him, he'll probably say, it's not Mara Post's fault. <laughs> maybe 10%. It's mostly your fault for not doing all the stuff that he talks about. That is heavily true, yes. Obviously, there are things that platforms do that are not so good, and that's where it hurts them. But you're exactly right. As far as that's concerned, that is something we are seeing right now, I'm seeing on partnerships, is we have somebody that manages lists. That's all they do. Something super simple. Everything else, they either outsource or they say, partner, you need to go find somebody else. And that's what I'm seeing more and more over the last year is partners are going to being very specific and I'll be, I manage your list for you. I'll create your email content. They're not really doing everything, if that makes sense. Yeah. The perennial problem of talented people who are used to doing everything and maybe have a small team that helps them do everything for their clients is understanding what ought they to focus on of the everything they could be doing. How do you help people or what do you recommend entrepreneurs do her in that problem? Uh, when I was working directly with agencies, <clears throat> and I'm back to doing that now because I'm the only one on channel at Maripost, so I get to do it all. What we'd like to dig into is what they do well. What are they seeing the most success from? So if you're running an NPS score, you're asking your customers, how well do we do? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Things like that, which we do on a regular basis. That allows you to kind of dial in what you do well versus what you want to do potentially. For example, I've had people give me feedback about this podcast and they said, wow, you ask really good questions. Like guests say this to me. And I say, wow, that's interesting because I keep on having people say the same thing. With, they say specifically, wow, you ask really good questions about this. You really helped me develop my ideas. And I think, oh, well, if I keep on hearing the same thing from people, maybe I should figure out how to do more of that, right? <laughs> exactly. And maybe not do something that I think I'm good at that I actually suck at. If you think you're really good at something, but no one has ever told you besides your mother that you're good at it, maybe you're not a master. And maybe, or at least you should get some feedback, like what you're talking about, Corey, with NPS score, get some feedback to find out, are you actually as good at insert talent here? <laughs> maybe you're not. Well, yeah. I mean, there's also things that, it, how easily does it come to you, right? Mm. So for me, I love partnerships. So the fact that I launched a partner program from the ground up in three weeks with Maripost tells you that it's something I'm passionate about because I was able to get it off the ground very quickly. Also, I know that it's V1. I know that there's going to be iterations throughout the next 12, 24, 36 months. My program today is not going to look the same as it, or it shouldn't look the same as it does in 12 months. And so that's kind of an example is when you find your passion, you can get it done really fast and people seem to appreciate that and like that. And so that's where you can kind of dial in your resources. You can dial in your service offering or if you want to offer multiple services, I've also seen agencies split those apart. So legitimately separate the companies. They'll run two to three different brands, if you will, or logos. You'll have your umbrella company. And within the umbrella company, you have company A, B, and C. And they're all yours, but they're all specific to one service or product offering. That is a fascinating concept. Even as you say that, I think, well, if I did that, what would I do? And the immediate answer is that... The one thing I do is the outsourced COO thing for companies in the seven figures, but that's really quite distinctive from a service offering that I do sometimes of, I'm going to go do deep dives and build analytics dashboards beyond what any standard app can do to create bespoke analytics solutions using Google Sheets and plus this. Like that's a really separate thing. I use it in the COO work sometimes, but those are sort of different things. They're not really connected. And I think, oh, of course, maybe I should have different brands with different pipelines. Exactly. And then also different partnership programs, right? Like different ways of saying partner with me. Like if I'm the outsource COO and I'm talking about here's what I do, then why would another company that does outsource COO work want to refer any business to me? That's crazy talk. But if I'm saying I have a brand where all I do is I develop custom dashboards for companies that need really high-end dashboards, then and you're a company that does outsource COO work, of course you might send clients to that one thing because I do this one thing and you know what it is. And if you need it, you really need it. Correct. And some people might think, oh, that's interesting because you might have a conflict of interest and things like that. Well, it's only a conflict of interest if you make it a conflict of interest. If you choose to get a lead from a outsourced CEO and you do the same thing and for your other company and you turn around and try to sell them your services from your other brand, 
then that's obviously the type of partnership that I think that original outsource COO company is looking for either. Yeah. And at that point in time, you've created your conflict of interest. But I know plenty of brands, plenty of small agencies that are moving in this direction. Yeah, that's really interesting. Tell me a little bit more about your three kinds of partners at Maripost. You have agency partner, app partner, and trusted advisor. And for folks who aren't familiar, that's M-A-R-O-P-O-S-T dot com. Give us the quick pitch as to why agencies that are looking to expand in 2021 ought to go take a look at Maripost. First and foremost, I want to tell you, when you build out a partner program, other people have done it successfully. Absolutely. There are definitely elements that you should copy from them. I do it all the time. I'm like, oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. I do the same thing with my partners as well. If I partner with somebody and I'm like, I really like the way they did that content, I ask them if I can use it and kind of steal their look and feel. And they're like, heck yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, the way that I always build a partner program is always pulling back to our customers and the services that our customers need. That is where I start my partner programs. And the reason why is because if my customers need those services, then those that are offering those services have my customers. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. So that is how I look at partner programs. So in the scenario with Maripost, the ones that we built were first and foremost, an evangelist type partner program, which is our trusted advisors, affiliate, basically, they send in cold and warm traffic, they're putting out comparison websites, or they just don't want to handle the implementation. They know that Maripost is the solution that their client needs. But earlier in our our conversation, they're not an all in one, Mm -hmm. they're not offering the implementation, and everything else, they're doing a a portion of, I help you create an online course, that's it. Mm-hmm. How you deliver it, that's somebody else's job. Yeah. So that's our trusted advisors. Then we do have our full service agencies. And these are agencies that are really kind of owning the front to back. And majority of the time, they're running larger front to back relationships. You know, they're sending 5 million, 10 million, 100 million emails a month type of relationships. So they're coming in and owning everything, the branding. But funny enough, the same partner that we have, they have three different products across three different companies. Hmm. And they share that so the customer knows, but they're executing on three different things, whether it's branding, whether it's email content, whether it's list delivery, whether it's list management, that type of stuff. So those are our agency partners. So on our trusted advisor partners, we pay them 10% of the first year. So anywhere between five and eight grand for a customer referral. On our agency side, they actually make 20% for life of that account because they're taking on all the risk and reward. So we have the ability to kind of give that cost of acquisition back to them. So anywhere between, you know, 12 and 16 grand in the first year. And then final, what kind of brings it around, which is our app partners. Those are our integration partners. So our integration partners are so, so vital and important and they don't get the time of day that most agencies and referral partners do. And that's unfortunate because Our integration partners and our app partners, they literally are the stickiness to keeping our customers. They're the retention piece of our partner program. At Infusionsoft, we know that once we hit three integrations with a customer, they would almost never leave. Their churn was almost to zero. Yeah. So it made them extremely sticky. So those are the three programs we launched. And within that, we see obviously differences in how many partners we have based on what group, based on the industry, right? We're in mid-market and smaller enterprise. So it's going to be a little bit different than, let's say, Active Campaign, who's in this SMB market, and they have a ton of agencies, a ton of one to uh, 15-person agencies. Mm -hmm. So those are our three programs. Wonderful. Thank you for that walkthrough. Folks, if you want to develop your partner program out more, you want to hear what Maripost has to offer, Corey has done a lot of thinking on this topic, obviously. Corey, (laughs) where is a great place for people to contact you? LinkedIn is one of the easiest places to reach me because I love to connect with people. I am in the business of relationships. You can also just email me directly at Corey at Maripost, M-A-R-O-P-O-S-T dot com. I would be happy to jump on a phone call and give you guys any tips and tricks I can to help you build out your partner programs. Fantastic. On LinkedIn, that's C-O-R-Y-S-N-Y-D-E-R. Corey, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me.